So, solving n equations requires n unknowns. So, equations like this. How many of you remember how to solve this? Let's see. Great. So, it's pretty easy. Two equations, two unknowns. And you could actually solve this pretty easy. And uh, then there is this enigmatic uh, kind of field coming out, deep learning, and says that make the number of unknowns in these two equations excessively large so that you get to a better solution. So how is that even possible? So let's look at it uh, with a more sensible example. So in this example, I'm showing you an AI system, outputs of an AI system that receive textual input and then translate those textual input into images. And it has learned uh, from a large corpus of data how to perform this task. As we see, uh, the, the, the kind of uh, text that we are asking this system is a portrait photo of a kangaroo wearing an orange hoodie and blue uh, sunglasses standing on the grass in front of the Sydney Opera House hold, holding a sign on the chest that says, Welcome Friends. As we see, the one on the left, the model on the left, generates almost all the features, but actually produces a dog almost, and it has like 350 million parameters to perform this task. And as we make the size of these networks larger and larger, we see that the fidelity of the images that are getting generated increases. So the one on the very right has 20 billion parameters and actually has a high fidelity in actually capturing everything that we ask this system to do. Now, I want to put this in perspective and tell you how do we look at it from statistics and from this statistical learning perspective. Now, on the x-axis, we have model size and accuracy. Classical statistics told us that up to a certain point, if you increase the size of models, you get really good accuracy out of them. And then after that, test accuracy, that means on, on data that they have never seen. And then after a point, actually, this would degrade. But then that seems to be the deep learning error actually shows us that this is not true. So after a while, if we keep increasing the size of the models, the accuracy, again, starts going up to the same level. And a new regime actually gets generated. We call it an over-parameterized regime, where we have like super large neural networks neural networks even larger than the training data that we have. And then in terms of accuracy, absolute accuracy, they're not that different from that peak that we see in this, the first peak. But new behavior emerges in that overparameters regime. So the first thing is that we will have more and more general behavior. So what that means, that means if you train a system to do a task in a domain, this system will be able to actually perform new tasks that you ask that it hasn't been trained on within the same domain that it has been trained on. Another uh, uh, kind of important uh, uh, feature that emerges out of this larger scale modeling is the fact that robustness increases after a certain point. So robustness means, for example, if you're driving uh, under rain, so how much your driving output decisions are kind of uh, stimulated by the rain itself. So perturbing the inputs of a system, how would it affect the outputs? Now, we see that if we make the networks larger and larger, robustness increases. Then not everything improves with the scale of these large systems. For example, on underrepresented samples, we see that after the first bump, there is a decrease in uh, a kind of performance on those minority samples with large language models or large uh, AI models in general. And then uh, reasoning, also the ability to actually find out logics from a task, from a given task, stays the same. It doesn't change as we scale these systems unless you provide the system with a uh, physical simulator. So if you guys, as an intelligent being, if you close your eyes, you can still 
imagine bouncing ball in your head because you have that intuitive physics engine in your head. If you provide this kind of simulation engine to AI, they would, be, they would actually be able to even improve on reason. So what I showed you is the modern era of statistics. Models are usually there. And as I said, there is great generalization we can get out, get out of them. They're robust in performing decision making. There is work to be done in the reasoning part. There are matters of bias and fairness to be addressed. There is the carbon footprint of these large scale models that are excessively large, and we have to really deal with how they, their energy consumption somehow. And at the same time, we need to have responsibility where uh, we are deep deploying this AI system in our society. So not only for the deployment, but also like for the development of the systems. So I've been working on something to get out of that space, get into the space where we have excessively small amount of parameters for a network while having the same characteristics that I said, maybe they're missing even in those larger scale models, and being able to be uh, basically accountable for decisions that our AI systems make. How did we do that? We went back to the source. So we looked into brains, not even human brain, we looked into animals' brain. Uh, and we started looking at it very fundamentally. So we started seeing what are the computational blocks of brains and how can we create AI systems based on the inspirations that we get from the brain science. Now, this allowed us to use equations that model the behavior of neurons and synapses, building blocks of intelligent systems. And then uh, by putting them together, this became a mathematical kind of tool that can um, perform uh, really well. And we call these systems liquid neural networks. These are neural networks that can stay adaptable even after training. That means when you train these neural networks, they can still adapt themselves based on the incoming inputs that they receive. So let me show you with a couple of examples, real world applications of these networks, what kind of behavior uh, we can get out of these systems. The first thing application is on this, in the space of autonomous driving. This is now a, a kind of, this is a dashboard I'm showing you, a liquid neural networks in action, receives camera inputs and generates a steering angle, uh, uh, basically drives the car in a lane-keeping lane task. The funny thing about this neural network is that it only has 19 neurons that drives this car in this control circuit. And if you, have, if you can perform driving with this such a small kind of artificial intelligence system, you would be able to actually pinpoint and say what is the responsibility and what is basically each of the system, each of the neurons in this network is actually doing when the driving decision is being made. Another uh, uh, important fact is basically uh, on the bottom left, we look into the decision-making process of these systems and where do they pay attention to when they take a driving decision, for example? So here, we see the brighter region is where the network is focused on when, when it's taking a driving decision. And in that cases, we see that um, it actually looks at the uh, edges and also like in the, into the road's horizon. Now, if I add a little bit of noise on top of the input, basically perturbing the input images, we can still see that the attention map of the system, the system actually tries to keep that attention map as, as to the representation that it has learned before. And this is actually a behavior that is not uh, present actually in other types of uh, AI systems. And then another fact here is that different types of technologies, AI systems, perceive the environment and learn differently. So given the same task. So here we see three different other technologies and compared to ours, for example, the first one on the left, it focuses on the road sides 
in order to make a driving decision. Another one, it has a scattered kind of attention all over the place. You cannot really pinpoint what's going on in its decision making. Then there is another one that actually shows that um, basically the, the, the attention is very f kind of jittery compared, uh, uh, when, when the lighting condition actually changes. And then we have our solution that has a kind of concise representation of where to look at in one of these uh, autonomous driving system uh, uh, examples. Let me show you one more example of a small reasoning task where we collect human <coughs> we collect human data where a drone is actually uh, moving towards uh, a drone has to move towards an object in an unstructured environment and then but then we collect this data without telling the, the AI or the system that this is the objective of the task. So the task is actually hidden inside the training data. Now, we train neural networks offline, and then we bring them back and deploy them on these drones, and the drone has to actually uh, uh, perform this task. So here is a standard deep learning model after the deployment. It actually has to move towards, it actually learned, when we train them offline, we see that they actually learn pretty well, and they're ready to be deployed. But then when we deploy them, we see that the behavior is completely scattered. For example, if you look at the attention map of this network, we see that the attention map is pretty uh, uh, scattered as well. So it focuses more on the lighting condition rather than the objective of the task. To find that target, then move towards it. Now, whereas if you have a liquid neural network, here we have 30 neurons that performs this task in the control system, we see that the network has learned to pay attention to that target and disregard everything else that is out there just from visual demonstrations to the system to complete this task. Now, and this is also important to mention that this environment is very drastically different from the training environment as well. So there is a different season basically going on when we are testing these systems. We are in the modern era of statistics, but there are possibilities to create systems and AI systems that are breaking the law. At the same time, maybe there's other uh, uh, kind of accesses of intelligence that we have to pay attention to. So scale is not all we need, but smarter design maybe is. Thank you. <laughs>